So it's time to get started. And so uh, I'm going to start with a prayer first. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of each person here, um, all of our parishioners, who support Grand Catholic, who support this parish in such wonderful, loving ways. We just ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us here tonight to inspire each of us in a way that uh, helps us grow the campus ministry, helps us grow in our own faith, and of course, helps us grow in relationship with you. That these uh, relationships be blessed, and that these relationships give you glory. And in all of this, uh, we lift it up to you through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins, now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, I would uh, welcome you. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I thank you for answering the invitation for you to come here this evening um, to hear a little bit more about ways in which you can be involved in helping us with campus ministry. And uh, I think one of the most important ways that we sometimes overlook or think that it's, it's not a big deal is through intercession, intercession and prayer. And prayer is such an important part of uh, what we do and, and how we inspire one another and how we hold each other up, um, how we heal each other, how we keep each other strong and give each other courage is always through prayer. And so um, intercessory prayer is, is pretty much what the topic will be tonight. Um, but I just want to kind of uh, thank you for opening your, your heart and your mind um, and maybe deepen your passion a little bit more tonight about uh, who we serve and how we serve our college students. And then again, I thank you for, uh, for really what you do every year is opening our doors opening our house, our house of worship, um, to the hundreds of college students that come through our doors, helping them to feel welcome, helping them to make this a home away from the home that they have wherever they come from. And of course, we have college students that come from all types of different parishes, all types of uh, religious uh, life that they experience. And so we try to um, make it really simple for them. And uh, so that there's not a lot of adjustment spiritually for them, but just good, solid, Catholic worship prayers so that they can be assured that uh, what we're really after is not just another person sitting with us in the pew, but another person that we want to walk with to Jesus Christ and really for the salvation of souls. And so that's how you inspire them. That's what they see when they come. They see your reverence, your love for the Lord, and that is huge for us um, because that does inspire them to want to keep coming and to want to be holy and faithful themselves. So thank you for that, and thank you for all you do. Um, Jessica Harris, who's been with us here in the parish for quite some time, she's had many different roles um, throughout the years, but uh, this year, her role is to be the interim campus director until the new director comes, which is next week. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then she, of course she will help her in that transition because it's a lot of work and a lot of things to do in that first year in any ministry is just really difficult. So we're blessed um, that Jessica is with us and uh, today she's gonna help us um, understanding our role um, as being permanent parishioners and how we can support the campus ministry. So thank you, Jessica. Yes, I only have a few more days where I get to be the interim director of campus ministry, so I got to get all my power trips out now <laughs> before they all get taken away. But um, so thank you all for coming, for expressing interest in this tonight. I hope that you're able to learn something new 
about your prayer life and your prayer style and how to integrate intercessory prayer in a more dynamic way in your life. So our goal for tonight is to take you a little bit deeper in a prayer style that we all naturally engage in anyway. When was the last time you prayed for someone? Hopefully within the last day, two days, three days. Like it, it goes across our minds so quickly. Like, oh, I need to offer a prayer. I need to, I need to pray for this person. I need to pray for that, that cause. Like, prayer comes to us quite naturally, I think. But there's a way that we can actually take it deeper and make it more fruitful in our own lives and the lives of those around us so that we can engage with God in a deeper way. So um, I want to talk about intercessory prayer specifically. The catechism lists five different types of prayer. Intercessory prayer is one of them. The other types are blessing and adoration. Most of that happens during our Mass. And then we have petition, which links with intercessory prayer, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's intercessory prayer, thanksgiving, and praise. So the five different styles of prayer. How does intercession fit into this? So intercession is actually a type of petition. A petition is where we go to God and we ask for something. Now, there's a little bit more to this that the Catechism tells us. That first, in petition, we acknowledge our sinfulness. Why? Because we actually don't deserve anything that we're asking for. If you really stop and think about it, God has given me so much. Who am I to say, actually, I need this one more thing, please? It, so, in, uh, petition is going to God as a good and loving father who loves to bestow riches and blessing on his children with generosity. Going to him with that level of trust and asking for more. That God wants to give us more. So now intercession, first, for, again, first acknowledges my sinfulness. I don't deserve this, God. I really don't. But I want to ask for it anyway because you are a good and loving God who loves to give me good things. The other thing that we ask for in both intercession and petition is that we ask for, and I think this is where a lot of people uh, don't really see their prayer in this light. And this can really help you. You are asking for the presence of the kingdom in the life, in your own life, or in the life of the person that you're praying for. You're asking for God's power, God's freedom, the heaven made present now with petition and with intercession. And this is straight from the catechism. This is what the church teaches, that we're asking for a bit of heaven now. We're asking for God's power to be made manifest in my life now or in the life of this other person. So intercession is then me looking at the needs of someone that I am close to or not close to. How many of you have prayed for people halfway around the world that are suffering from something? Yes, we don't have to be close to them. There are a couple of Bible stories that I'm going to use to illustrate what is Jesus, how does Jesus handle intercession when people bring petitions to him? How does he handle it when he's walking this earth? So you, as the intercessor, you're, you're making an intercession for a specific person or a cause or a group of people. What um, mentality should we have as we enter into this? Who is the main, who is the primary intercessor for us to God? Jesus. Jesus is the intercessor. So anytime we engage in intercessory prayer, we look to him as our model. How does Jesus intercede for us? And we enter into that understanding. So let's take a look. I brought my Bible. Did anyone else bring your Bible? <laughs> you guys are all good Catholics. <laughs> um, but I'm going to read a few quick um, snippets of Jesus talking about prayer, specifically intercessory prayer. But first, for prayer in general, I want to read one passage. This is from Matthew 7. And this is the attitude we should have in any prayer that we enter into. And once I start reading it, you're going to be like, oh, I've heard this before. But not quite this way. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, 
and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If you read the original Greek that Matthew wrote in, the words ask, seek, and knock are commands. They're not suggestions. Jesus is commanding us, you ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened for you. He's commanding us to do these things. And so when Jesus commands us, so many of us, myself included, when I bring my prayer before Jesus on the crucifix, I'm like, please God, if it's your will, only if it's your will, I don't want it if it's not your will. I only want your will. Like, please, if, if you can make some time to maybe intercede for this person, help this person out over here. How many of us have that, like, almost humble begging, like, oh, God's too busy or God's too, too um, concerned with these starving children in Africa to hear about my bad day? Like, <laughs> they, we, we often don't see God as big enough to care about all the concerns in the world. And we also don't trust him enough, which is why he says, you need to ask. <laughs> you need to seek, you need to find. Or you need to knock. So, <laughs> see, <he's, yeah. laughs> thank you. <laughs> preach it, Jessica, preach it. <laughs> so that's the attitude that we approach in both petition for myself and intercessory prayer on behalf of others. I approach God knowing that he's commanded me to do this. And there is confidence in that. The people that I have seen pray amazing prayers all pray with incredible confidence. It's not this groveling, begging, like, Lord, I, if, I, if I do this one more penance, there's nothing wrong with doing penances and we should do them. But maybe he didn't answer my prayer because I didn't do that one penance well enough. Or I didn't mean this prayer well enough. No. That's not God. So let's now take a look then at a couple of different examples where people actually bring someone else to Jesus. And how does Jesus respond to intercession in his own day and time? The first one, interestingly enough, we have this command of ask, seek, knock. Um, in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 8, the very next chapter, Jesus gives us clear examples of how to go about this. He actually demonstrates it for them. At the beginning of Matthew chapter 8, very beginning, he's just finished talking about this. A leper comes to him and says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And, stretched out his, and he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. So here we have, it's not an intercession. You have someone making a petition. They want something done for themselves. But here, it shows you a key understanding that we need to have when, we, when it comes into prayer. It's talking about the will of God. If God wills it, it can happen, and it will happen. Because look at how he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He trusts God. He absolutely trusts that God can make this happen. Now it's a matter of does God will it? And that's the, that's the, that is the million dollar question when we are praying. Is God, do you will this or don't you? I don't know what to pray for. But again, he doesn't hesitate to ask, Lord, if you will it, you can make me clean. The very next section is the story of the centurion and his servant. So Jesus is again demonstrating, okay, I've told you to ask, seek, and knock. Now here are three different people, because there's a third person. There are three different people now that I'm going to show you to demonstrate how this works. The centurion with the servant. We all know this story. You have the Roman centurion, a high-ranking official. He has a hundred soldiers under him. He is a bigwig. He's a hotshot. But he has this servant. Some translations call him a servant boy. So he has almost this child that he cares deeply about who is sick enough that he is seeking a Jewish healer. That should tell you something, how sick this boy is and how much he loves this servant of his. That he's going to seek a Jewish healer for this miracle. 
And even then, his faith is astounding. Jesus, he tells Jesus, we all know this, like, Lord, you are not, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant shall be healed. These are the very words we say in Mass every Sunday. But Jesus, it's very fascinating. What does Jesus do the healing based on? Because Jesus then praises him. I have not seen such faith in Israel. I have not seen such faith in Israel. And then he says, and this is fascinating, he's the Lord of the universe, but what does he say? Go, be it done for you as you have believed. He makes the healing conditional on the centurion's belief. So if I have more faith, we all know this, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, what can you do? (laughs) Move mountains. So if I have faith that a healing can occur, can it? God sometimes makes my prayers, the effect of my prayers contingent on my faith. So if you aren't seeing the prayer results that you want to see in your intercessory prayer in your day-to-day lives, the people that you're praying for, what should you do? Grow in faith. I need to have more faith in God if I want to ask more of him. So the third one so we have the first, the first healing was petition. The second healing is very clearly intercession. The third healing is the type of random healing that nobody asked for. Jesus doesn't do these too often, but he did it this time. It was Peter in law, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. He walks into Peter's house, sees that she's sick, and just heals her. And sometimes, have any of you experienced that, where you just receive uh, almost like a miracle, big or small, unasked for from God, So God's not going to necessarily operate on just, oh, Jessica's praying, and she's praying this formula, therefore I get to do this miracle for her. Or she has enough faith. Sometimes God just does things because he wants to. (laughs) Um, So those are some other examples, then, of intercessor, well, the centurion being the main one. I want to take a look at one of my favorite healing miracles that goes deeper into intercession, especially as related to the power that we concretely have and the effect that we can have on the soul of the other person. Not just the body. We can pray for, for physical healings, but also spiritual healings as well. So this is Mark chapter 2. Jesus is preaching in, his, in Peter's house, and the crowds are so thick that nobody can get through. But there is a paralytic man who desperately wants to be healed. And his friends want it for him just as badly as he does. So what do they do? They drag the paralytic man up to the roof, tear a hole in the thatching of the roof, and lift him down. This is fascinating. They don't let the crowd stop them. I mean, if I were the person carrying my friend, I would have been like, sorry, dude, kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> We're not going to, we'll find Jesus another day. Like, this is going to be really hard to try and make it through this crowd. How many of us would have given up on our friend? So persistence and perseverance here is key. They persist and they persevere to get to Jesus. Often in our prayer, we just toss up our prayers and we just let them go. We don't make sure that we're in front of Jesus when we are presenting our prayers. That I see God in my mind, in my prayer, and then bringing my petition to him. We just toss it up and then move on through our day. But making sure that they made sure that they were in the Lord's presence before they asked. They pushed. So then, what does Jesus do? This is fascinating. First, he says, like, it's clear. The guy wants to be healed physically. But what does Jesus say? He looks at the faith of the friend. He says it looks at, he looked at their faith and said, my son, your sins are forgiven. We Catholics know that we have to go to confession to have our sins forgiven. But did you know that you can pray on behalf of someone else and intercede for them and God can have mercy on them? If they are far away from the church, can we pray for them and can God have mercy on them? Absolutely. 
This is what's happening here. He doesn't look, he might be looking at the faith of the paralytic, but it says he looks at the faith of the friends and says, my son, your sins are forgiven. He brings the kingdom into this man's life. He was separated from God and now he is not. And then everybody, all of the Pharisees and all the other people in the crowd that are doubting his authority are throwing a tissy fit. And they say, well, wait, hold on a second. You forgive sins? He's like, hold on. If you think forgiving sins is hard, which is harder, forgiving sins or making this man walk? Fine. Get up and walk. So Jesus here demonstrates two levels of intercessory prayer, two levels of intercession in the lives of others, spiritual healing and physical healing, that both are possible through our prayers. Through the, we can pray for the, how many of you are praying for the conversion of a family member or a friend? That's most of us here in the room. We all pray for this. Do we actually believe that our prayers are going to do something? <laughs> do we actually approach God with that confidence of ask, seek, knock? And are our prayers going to do something? So, um, I want to share two quick stories about a couple of saints that had intercessory prayer. Because it's nice to think like, oh, well, that was Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago. He's not necessarily walking among us right now, Jessica. Come on. It's nice when the Messiah is right next to you doing these miracles. What about us normal everyday people? So two saints that when I was just doing a quick brainstorm that immediately came to mind. The first one is St. Catherine of Siena. She was watching a man get carted away to be hung for, I think he was a murderer or an insurrectionist. Um, he was being carted away to the gallows, and she was watching from her window. And with her spiritual understanding, she, the man was blaspheming and cursing God as he was being dragged away, screaming at the top of his lungs. We have a pretty good account of this because her spiritual director is the one writing about this story. So the one who actually knew her and actually witnessed this part of her life wrote about this story. So is this a true story? Yes, it is. So St. Catherine of Siena, she's witnessing this man blaspheming and cursing God, and she actually sees demons over his head and circling around him and encouraging him to say these things. And she, recognizing the power of prayer, falls to her knees and starts praying that this man be released and freed. The demons flee. The man instantly repents, converts, and starts praising God before he accepts willingly the punishment that his community was giving him. All she did was pray, and this man, mass, like murderer, converts. It's a very similar story. We have St. Therese of Lisieux, but this time she didn't even see the man. They lived across France from each other. She read in her local newspaper that there was a, a convicted criminal who was unrepentant of his crimes, that was non-religious, hated religion, refused to see a priest, and so she started praying. She read an article the following week saying that the man had repented, gone to confession, and died praising God. And she said, this is, in her, this is in her autobiography, her journal. She writes about this. She knew that God gave her the spiritual insight that she knew that it was because of her prayers that this man converted. God gave her that confirmation after the fact. So the power of intercessory prayer to change and transform someone else's life. It's incredible. So now to sum this up and make it concrete in our own lives. We should ask God for things. We should ask God for impossible things. What more trust can we bestow in an all-powerful creator than to ask him for the impossible? Or the, at least the improbable, right? Like, we show, it's, it's almost a, God, I'm going to ask you the impossible. That's a sign of trust, and it allows God to show off, really. It's like, oh, sure, that's, that's a flick of my wrist. <laughs> Let's make that happen. So ask God for things. Ask God for impossible things. If you want your intercessory prayer to be more powerful in your own life and the lives of those around you, grow in faith. We often think that faith is just the virtue that we, we're given and we just exercise it, but we can grow in it. Grow in faith. Grow in your knowledge of God. 
The other thing is, is detaching from sin in your life and in my life. Detachment from sin because sin blocks my ability to see what's actually good for me and good for those around me. When I'm detached from sin, when I'm not consistently sinning in my life, I'm actually able to see and hear God working more effectively in the lives, in my own life and the lives of those around me. When you are praying, this is a trick that I actually use when I do intercessory prayer and especially when I'm actually seated, trying to focus on my intercessory prayer and praying for someone. I picture myself in front of Jesus. And then I bring the person that I'm praying for by the hand in front of Jesus. And then I actually ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you want for this person? And I want to ask you for that. Or sometimes it is just me like, Lord, I know what your will is and I want to continue to ask that your will be done for this person in my life. So that's just a little technique that I use in my intercessory prayer, making sure that I'm in the presence of Jesus and then bringing that person in, in my mind and in my heart to Jesus with me. Um, This is a question I get asked a lot. I teach RCIA and I teach a lot of prayer classes. A question that I get asked a lot, well, Jessica, what if I'm praying for the wrong thing? Um, I can say this with absolute confidence. If you are truly pursuing God in your life and you are praying for the wrong thing, God will let you know. And it's not going to be some ugly thing of like, you know, he's going to come and smack you on the wrist of like, you were praying wrong. No, that's not how God works. It's going to be a gentle understanding over a period of time of like, oh, actually, this isn't the right thing to pray for. Um, I just spoke with a woman yesterday that that was her very experience. She was praying for one thing, and then God slowly revealed to her over the course of a couple of weeks that this wasn't what she was supposed to be praying for. And through conversations, she, she turned it into what she should be praying for. That if we're continually pursuing God, God wants us to get it right. He's going to help us out. So don't be worried about praying for the wrong thing. Run to God, pursue him, and he will correct you as you continue to pray. So now, how does this play into campus ministry? Here's my sales pitch, everyone. (laughs) It's actually not really that big of a sales pitch, to be honest. So we're trying something new this year. We really wanted to make parishioners feel more involved and give them the opportunity to engage with what we're doing on campus. Um, For the first two weeks, um, the statistic is that 80% of college students lose their faith within the first two weeks of school. That means for the first two weeks of school, we're on campus or we're doing something every day. It's kind of like overtime times 10 on our parts. But we're on campus, we're with students every day trying to make a connection. Some way that we can get through to them in a way that they will respond to us and please come to something. Please give us a connection to you so that we can encourage you to continue to live out your faith. So that means for the first two weeks, we're on campus a lot. We encounter thousands of college students because there's 30,000 of them on campus. Statistically, we encounter thousands of them. In 2019, because we didn't do this in 2020, Um, In 2019, we encountered, we actually got names, phone numbers, and emails of 800 students. Like, that's, that's not a small chunk. That's a good chunk of students. What we want to do here is, as we are on campus, meeting these students, getting to know them, and trying to show them the beauty of faith and the beauty of who God is, we would love it if parishioners were here praying for them by name. We are actually working on trying to um, have the, the names, the first names of the students that we encounter on campus on these TVs live updated. So that way people can be praying for them by name as we are encountering them. The power of intercessory prayer. What could this do for a student who is not quite sure what they want to do with their life? They're not mass murderers like St. Um, Catherine and St. Therese encountered. (laughs) Like, how much prayer do they need to have that subtle change of heart for the Holy Spirit to burst into their souls with grace and be like, no, I'm here and I want you for myself. Like, I want you to belong to me. So, we're trying to have adoration in, we're going to have adoration in the church, open to the entire parish, um, and we're encouraging parishioners to come at the same time that we're on campus 
here praying for us, that we do our jobs well, and that we're docile to the Holy Spirit, and that the students are open, and that there is true conversion of heart as this is taking place. So, um, and then for those that can't make it, because oftentimes we're on campus in the middle of a workday, we're also working on trying to have it updated on our website live, so that you can pray wherever you are. Um, and just, you know, take your lunch break and go pray a rosary watching the website, seeing the names updated, a live stream almost. So that's what we're doing. If you are interested in walking alongside us in this, we would love to have you. Um, we are going to have signups outside on, at the tables where all you're eating dinner, the signups are QR codes. We're all familiar with those now. <laughs> the signups are QR codes. You can scan them with your phone. If you're more old fashioned and you want to come talk to me personally, I will help you sign up for a time. There, the times that we're going to be on campus are listed on the signup sheet. So find, if you could find an hour of your time to come and be in adoration while we're on campus, that would be amazing. I truly do believe that the Holy Spirit will pour himself out on CSU's campus the more that we enter into this prayer life together. So, um, I think that's everything. Um, yes. All right. So, Thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you learned something a little bit new about intercessory prayer and its power. I hope that you walk away feeling a little bit more um, excited to pray for the people in your life. Um, we are now going to be serving dinner. So to facilitate and make it easier to get the dinner, we're asking that everyone use this door over here because the dinner is kind of like set up. Uh, the tables are set up right in, in this entryway. So we'll create a line on this side. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, please come talk to me afterwards. I'll be available to help people sign up for a time if they want help signing up. Or you can just use your phones and scan the QR code, and it'll take you right to the sign-up sheet. So thank you, everyone. Let's close in a quick prayer, and then um, Father Rocco is... I'm not sure if he's going to pray grace or not, so we'll just pray grace here. <laughs> so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the the beautiful community of St. John the 23rd, I ask that you help us to all grow in faith, hope, and charity, that you pour out your spirit upon us and make us true and faithful disciples of your word. We ask that you make our path to you level and smooth and straight, and that we may continue to bless and glorify you all the days of our life. Please bless the food and drink that we are about to consume as we pray. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.